Hello. Thanks for the invitation to speak at this fantastic workshop series. And before I start, I would like to, uh, to join everyone in celebrating 10 years of this fantastic workshop on fine-grained visual categorization. And it's nice to find the uh, first web page from CVPR 2011, specifying the number of days since uh, this workshop started. And one interesting aspect that this workshop had introduced, of course, is the notion of not only fine-grained, but also multimodal, combining visual understanding with text modalities, even audio modalities, on things to do with uh, these birds' sounds. And um, the work of, of Serge, Pietro, and everybody who had been involved over the past 10 years has been very instrumental to the research community. Um, this talk, I want to ask about the difference between fine-grained understanding in images and that in video. So let's see an example from Epic Kitchens. So in this particular example, and I was keen to show you the audio as well, um, the question isn't really what type of garlic this is, because that can be achieved from individual images. The questions to do, to do with fine grain understanding in video is to understand things about smashing the garlic, like when was the garlic exactly smashed? How was it smashed? Maybe how skilled is this person in the task? and whether we're done now with smashing the garlic or further hits are needed. And of course, the research along these directions will ask questions like what information are needed to come up with this level of fine-grained understanding, like changes in appearance, um, motion or even force, which we somehow can perceive from the video, um, audio, and there is a search of whether other types of information, maybe depth, is required to achieve that level of fine-grained understanding. So um, my group has led really the collection of this large scale dataset Epic Kitchens, and we call it natural capturing of the object interactions, maybe different from the iNaturalist as in, in the nature. This is more unscripted understanding of people by capturing them performing activities in their environment, so in their kitchens. The dataset has 100 hours of annotated footage, and this footage is capturing um, things like what the people are doing in these untrimmed videos. So from this type of footage, and I'll tell you a little bit first about how we collected the footage, we can achieve this level of fine-grained understanding. In Epic Kitchens, we gave people cameras to take to their homes, and we asked them to record everything they've done in their kitchens for three consecutive days. So no further instructions were given apart from how to start the camera, etc. People don't do these unscripted recordings of videos because they're very difficult to ground truth. You have hours of people doing different things. So we basically initiated this notion of giving narrations. So people watching the videos and then basically saying what they've done after the recording. So they just watch the video and speak over them as if they're giving subtitles. From these, we had a scalable approach to achieve dense action segments. And in 2018, released the first version, which we now call Epic Kitchens 55. Two years later, we went to some of these people and some new people, collected an extension of this data set, improved our narration interface using a pause and talk narrator, which is publicly available, achieving higher density annotations and improved quality annotations. And now we have Epic Kitchens 100. The data set is naturally unbalanced. So the y-axis here is very much log scaled with a lot more examples of certain actions than others. The two colors here are from the first version of the dataset and the second version, the extended version is the um, solid colors. And we also provided one level of hierarchy to combine things like washing and drying and brushing and soaking into clean, etc. and similarly for nouns. If you want to know about Epic Kitchens, you can visit the web page and we on uh, Sunday the 20th, we released the third set of winners, the first set of winners on the extended version of the data set on five benchmarks. In the remaining time, I want to tell you about some of the work we're doing within my group on this fine grained understanding using Epic Kitchens as well as other data sets. We've been working on understanding the skill level or how well people do tasks. We have some work on changing the level of supervision um, whether using some self-supervised signals or few shot learning, works on combining vision and language to achieve this finer grain understanding, 
as well as audiovisual fusion. And these are all recent works in the past two, three years. Um, I will, in this talk, focus on two aspects which I believe are most relevant to the workshop here, which is the aspect of how well you're doing something and the combination of vision and language to achieve fine-grained understanding. And let's start with the work on skill determination from video. Um, and we're looking at the task like this, which is we want to assess the relative skill for a collection of video sequences of a certain task, say people drawing. And it's easy to achieve annotations for these by giving people two videos, say on Amazon Mechanical Turk, and asking them to label which video they believe exhibits a higher level of skill in the task of drawing. People will disagree why they think the right side is better than the left side. Maybe it is the emotion of the sonic, how the eyes are drawn, or maybe how smooth the lines are, but they will all agree that the right side is exhibiting higher skill. Prior work on skill determination focused on things like maybe the Olympics, where there is a score you're aiming to achieve. We don't want to achieve to, to build an Olympic committee for drawing. We just want to know whether someone exhibited a higher level of skill. So it's very different than prior works on understanding um, performance of certain tasks from video. So in this work, which was published in CVPR 2019, we had as input these two videos labeled in the first uh, in, during training using a CME's architecture, so shared weights, and you have a 3D um, backbone that extracts motion as well as appearance. And you can look throughout the video, maybe combine the information across doing some um, global pooling over time. And then you will have some sort of a ranking loss saying based on the training, one is exhibiting a higher skill than the other. But of course, in this example of braiding hair, not all the video is relevant to skill. There are tasks that are so easy, like combing your hair. That's not where skill really is exhibited. So naturally you would have some sort of an attention to attend to parts of the video that are relevant to skill. And in this work, we show that by adding another loss that compares the attention to the average pooling, you achieve higher stability. Still after doing the basic, which is how people do deep ranking, we notice that mistakes don't get picked up by the attention module as parts of the video with high attention. So they don't get picked up at all. And the reason is, is the deep ranking concept of sharing weights because mistakes don't appear in all the pairs of videos. In fact, they appear in, in only the weaker videos. Similarly, if someone is exhibiting something that is very high skill, it doesn't get picked up because it's not common in all the videos. So in, we introduced the notion of using multiple attention modules. And until now, they're exactly the same until we introduce this, not this loss which actually specializes these attention modules to attend to what's good in the video and what's bad in the video or what's a weaker part of uh, the skill level. And these are attended to again in a Siamese architecture and we call this the pros and cons. Through training, we have these high skill attention attending to what makes a video of a higher skill and weaker skill. And indeed, these are successful in picking up these mistakes. So for example, this is the low skill attention module in different tasks. And in applying eyeliner, it is when pe the people are removing a bit of what they've done. So it is it had learned to pick up that this is evidence of low skill or when people unfold in origami. In contrast, in the high skill, you have people firming their fold in origami as evidence of high skill. And I very much like the last example of drawing because this is picking hesitation or stopping as evidence of high skill in drawing, while other tasks like maybe putting makeup, pausing is evidence of low skill. The power of machine learning in computer vision is that we no longer have to think about these tasks or these handcrafted behaviors, and these are learned from the training data. For all the works I present, if you want to look at the code or the data sets, there are web pages that you can look at for every paper. The other work we've done on understanding how well is related to what I call completion. Completion is when you start a task, but you fail to actually achieve the goal from it. Let's get an example from the HMDB dataset, a popular dataset used for training action recognition. And this is the action of blowing candles. In the first video, the person successfully blows the candles by the end. But in the second video, also from the same dataset, 
this poor kid keeps blowing these difficult to blow out candles all the way until the end of the video. And in this work, we propose the method that can detect the moment at which the goal is completed. And we're comparing the method to ground truth, changing from orange pre-completion to purple post-completion, as well as detecting the case on the right, where even until the end of the video, the goal remains incomplete. We apply this to a variety of daily tasks like drinking or maybe picking something from the floor to detect the moment there is a belief that the person had achieved the goal, which is drinking or picking. These two things, understanding skill and understanding the moment of completion and very much aligned with, as I introduced, the goal of understanding fine-grained um, actions or understanding actions in a fine-grained manner from videos. Moving to the second part on vision and language, I'll start with using language as a way for fine-grained understanding and first, the part of speech of a sentence. So this is the notion of cross-modal retrieval. You have a sentence and you want to retrieve relevant videos or you have a video and you want to retrieve relevant captions, a popular task. And in this work, we actually looked at um, a finer grained understanding by projecting into two embedding spaces instead of the typical one, one capturing the verb or the action and one capturing the noun. So we parse the sentence into the verbs and the nouns and then we have the, um, the same video embedded, but using different projections into this verb embedding space and noun embedding space. And once we have these multi-view embeddings, we call them, then you can actually combine these visual embeddings from both part of speech embedding spaces, as well as the text embeddings and learn a full action embedding space in which you can do your standard retrieval. So interestingly, you, you will have these two different projections, visual projections, that are specializing to look at the objects regardless of the action and the action regardless of the object. And indeed, if we look at some examples, so these are activations in these embedding spaces, the neurons of the projections, and you will see one neuron with high activations being chopping boards regardless of the action, chopping boards being used for cutting or being washed or being moved. And if you instead look at the verb embedding space, you have a neuron that activates for opening and closing regardless of the object. And clearly that allows you to generalize to unseen combinations. So do zero shots by actually combining different verbs and nouns. Another part of speech we've published a work on uh, last year, which was really novel, is looking at adverbs. So adjectives have been studied in the notion of um, understanding, fine green understanding in images, but adverbs also offer finer green understanding in videos. And in this work, we're using some uh, in instructional videos from the How to 100 Million data set, where we have the sentence and the sentence includes an adverb. The person is teaching and saying, you need to uh, turn this ball slowly or fill this partially. Can we learn this, adj this adverb? Can we learn what slowly means? because that's very much a fine-grained understanding of the action or of the video. And in this work, we use also a retrieval space. So we have the video and we have the parsed sentence and we can embed the verb rolling. And our objective is to learn what we call a, an action modifier inspired by similar works in adjectives that changes the rolling into rolling quickly. And we know this video is exhibiting rolling quickly, so we aim to embed the video close to the modified action. And also we aim to learn this in a weekly supervised manner because we don't know exactly where in the video the rolling takes place. We have the sentence roughly around, but not exactly at the moment the rolling takes place. And so we include a, a, an attention mod module. So we have features of um, the video around the sentence. And then we're using the verb as a query to attend to the parts of the video relevant to the action rolling, which is then embedded close to the learned modifier, learned modified verb into um, rolling quickly. And I'll show you some of the examples. So what you'll see is the thickness of the border will, in, will, um, will focus on attending to the verb mix. So we know we're mixing, we're attending to the verb mix, and accordingly we're predicting the adverb. So you'll have mixing quickly. Um, maybe you'll have mixing slowly. So that's another example. Uh, or maybe you'll have 
this is an example of someone turning. And again, you're focusing first on the bit where you can detect the actual word, and then you predict the adverb. It's really a very interesting uh, work that I encourage you to look at if you're into the fine-grained understanding of, of videos. Uh, last, in the in this sense, and there is one more work after it, is a work we're presenting this CVPR, or we presented this CVPR, because you'll see this after the presentation, on understanding the link between videos and captions. And that's a common problem in video understanding, because we have a video and a set of captions, and correctly, we want to identify the caption that's most relevant, or maybe rank these captions. But there are lots of data sets where you have the video on the left, a set of captions on the right. And according to the data set, one caption has been corrected, collected with this video and is deemed correct. Another equally relevant caption, like a demonstration of origami, is considered wrong because it has not been collected with this exact video. And this assumption that there exists only one corresponding caption in the retrieved sentences is invalid for many data sets we looked at. For example, the MSR VTT data set, very popular in video retrieval. You'd see this video on the right, this is a keyframe. The ground truth is a band is performing for the crowd. Indeed, in my opinion, the last sentence, three guys singing and playing is actually more relevant because there are no crowd actually appearing in this video. But if a method actually retrieves the last sentence as the top sentence, it will be penalized because that's not the ground truth. So the question is, how can we improve this? for these large scale data sets without having to label every relationship between a video and a caption, because that's very expensive. In the work, we propose proxies that look at the relevance between the captions, assuming that the caption has sufficient information to describe the video. And we propose a number of, of, proxy, of proxy functions and discuss their pros and cons. With these proxy functions, we can then look at the video the caption according to the ground truth, the other captions that are also relevant. And for each method, we can look at the top performing, the, the highest retrieval and the lowest retrieval, because these are all relevant. So we can look at the range of performance of that particular method. With that range, we can add that as bars on the geometric mean, which is the uh, metric used for these video retrieval tasks. And we can see that the bar is very big, in fact, in many cases, it doesn't distinguish the baseline, which is MME, just an MLP, with more recent and supposedly better methods. So we propose instead to use a, a continuous scale of relevance between videos and captions um, and using NDCG as a metric. And when we do so, interestingly, we actually, so the left side is the instance, the old style, and the four other ones are the proxy measures we propose. And for every one of them, and every data set, as you can see in the paper, if you look in more, if you read it, for every case, you no longer have a distinction between the baseline and these newer methods. In fact, the baseline can outperform these newer methods when we incorporate this understanding of semantic similarity and we remove this incorrect assumption that the video is only relevant to one caption. Before time finishes, I want to show you some work we presented last year in ACCB about explainability of videos. Given a video passed to a model, you can predict how likely it is of a particular class. But this work looks at the response of the um, model to this video and breaks it into the prior probability of the class and then the contribution of every individual frame to know which frame is actually most influential in making that decision. Inspired by um, works in, in game theory, you can then add one frame, sorry, add one frame, look at then the difference between the expected prior and the frame, then add another frame, and then again, look at the difference and add the third frame. And you can accordingly look at the difference between these responses, and these have to be attributed to this added frame. But of course, you can add frames in any order. So in this work, at, we published code for this, you can actually calculate all possible combinations fairly efficiently. You can also note that some frames actually contribute negatively to the model's response. Actually not having that frame in the video is actually, can improve the performance of the model in the sense it can make the model more um, correct for a certain class because that frame might be either ambiguous 
or more relevant to other classes in the data set. And um, our work is then enabling you to get this understanding of all frames and attribute the, the frame's response to a particular class, including negative ones. This is from the something something data set. And what you can see is that the action is showing that something is empty. And when the person actually flips, they are not really contributing to that class. And that is giving you negative contributions um, of these particular frames. We have a published public dashboard that allows you to play with this task. So you can choose a class and then look at the attribution of a model that we provide and then see the attribution of that particular model and which exact frames correspond to this class, which is pouring something out of something. You can look at errors. So this is again from the same class and you can see the person pouring and the frames contributing. But in fact, this is the second highest class it, it, the video is incorrectly labeled as turning something upside down. And by playing with the dashboard, you can look at the end of the video. And in fact, at the end, the person had turned the cup all the way upside down. And that's why the video is incorrectly labeled as turning something upside down. And really, it gives you a very good understanding of models, their successes and their failures. And there is code if you want to test your own model and on another data set. Before I conclude, I get the pleasure of presenting this work and thanks again for the invite. But this is work of an amazing, very dedicated team, all the way from collecting the data set to these set of works I presented. And I'm very grateful to be working with such passionate researchers. If you have any questions, do let me know.